Hello, I'm Dr Elaine Davey. I'm Vice Chair of the Welsh Historic Gardens Trust, a trustee of Rupera Castle Preservation Trust and Rupera Conservation Trust. I first became aware of Rupera Castle from an image in Tom Lloyd's book called The Lost Houses of Wales. And there's this wonderful castle sort of on my doorstep, just outside of Cardiff. And there it is, and it's part of a farm. I couldn't believe it, you know, it's extraordinary. We're making this video because of the importance of the site. It's in this wonderful magic green triangle between Caerphilly, Cardiff and Newport, which needs to be protected and um, enhanced. Caerphilly has done a wonderful job on actually highlighting the importance of this green triangle through their um, sustainable master plan. The setting is really important to be protected because it's quite a hidden little site and uh, I think mostly only no locals know about it. Describing the castle as it is now, for people that see it as a ruin, it's quite hard to imagine what it would have looked like. We have a sketch that somebody had made of it as it would have looked and when it was complete with um, quite notable Elizabethan gables. It's on a square plan form, which you can see now. There's a circular tower at each corner and only the battlements on the circular towers are crenellated. The south porch is still there. It's quite different, but uh, it gives a good idea of how stately it must have looked, how impressive. So we've got one sketch from 1684 by Thomas Dineley. Near the house, there is a formal layout of courtyards and you progress through the courtyards through the entrance gatehouse, the second entrance gatehouse, and then progress up the stairs, you're becoming more and more impressed as more and more of the castle is revealed to you. So close to the um, castle, the house, there is this formal setting, but beyond that, of course, there's a deer park. And, you know, a very settled landscape in a time when perhaps things had started not to be so settled again. Moving on through the centuries, the family fortunes change, different descendants have different ideas, and fashions are changing. Although we have um, this document, it's a map of the domain of Rupera from 1764, and that shows still a very formal layout. The garden around the castle is connected to this, the wider setting of the woodland on Coed Crag Rupera behind. And there's a walk up to the mott, but cut into the trees are what they call five alleys, which are five viewpoints. So as you walk up to the mott, you can see out across the Rupera Park and out across to the um, Bristol Channel. This is all an integrated landscape with a summer house to settle in at the top of the walk. It's all about promenading, enjoying the estate. That's quite interesting because it, even though it shows this formal setting around the castle still, the fashion for sweeping away formal gardens was changing. It's quite a, a, quite a stunning, sophisticated layout of a garden for Wales. And, and especially for its time, because there were very few people of that status, because with the Tudors, anybody of any um, wealth or ambition had moved to the Tudor court, and they'd all become quite important courtiers and kept their, their wealth and power and position in England. So this is another feature about the Morgans, that they retained that level of connection with their, their roots, their Welshness. The castle has this dreadful fire in the late 1700s and then is rebuilt in a slightly different layout. The elevations are slightly different to what they were originally. The, the square plan form is still there, the circular towers that are battlemented and then it's the crenellations are carried around the whole building. So it's simplified in many ways. And also the setting is simplified because fashions had moved on and some former gardens were going out of fashion. There are still features surviving from the Jacobean period. The wall is there and certain other elements there. And actually, we've never done an archaeological survey under the existing gardens. There may be more there than we think. 
uh, and certainly the um, survivals that are there make it very rare in terms of Wales because it's only at St Donat's and Raglan Castle that there are features of gardens left from that period apart from Rupera Castle. One of my favourite images of the castle is the one of Courtney astride his horse and you can see how well cared for the landscape and the castle is at that stage. It just looks so pretty, it's in that lovely setting, the gardens are well maintained and the whole place looks just as if it's much loved, which is important. And then you've got that lovely setting of the Koi Kwai Rupera behind it. It's just a beautiful image of a time lost, really, sadly, by the First World War. But um, I, that is one of my favourite images. And one of my other favourite images, of course, is of the greenhouse astride, as it were, as the centrepiece of this garden. And it's out of all proportion too, really, if you think about it, this huge greenhouse, which has um, got carnation houses on either side, and had a massive team of gardeners working away on this glorious garden. Um, it really is, you know, a sort of the last hurrah of a long, long gone by age. Post-World War I, it was a national war effort really, was to grow more timber. So all of that wonderful deciduous woodland was stripped out and conifers were planted. And they remained there for decades and sadly made the soil very sterile. The house, the whole estate of Rupera was put up for sale, but no buyer could be found. So then, of course, the drums of war start up again and within a few years, Rupera is requisitioned for the war effort, for the Second World War effort. During World War II, there was a succession of troops billeted there. In December 1941, because of the, the relatively old wiring system and the fact that the place was full of soldiers all over, there was a, um, an electrical short that resulted in a massive fire. Sadly, it burned away and it became the shell it is you see now. Rupera then, of course, is left. I mean, you know, the post-World War II efforts of reclaiming Britain are pretty extensive and then there was rationing for a long time, which included building materials. So nothing happens to the Rupera until 1956 when it's sold as part of the sale of the whole of the Tredegar estate all 53,000 acres and um, then it enters a period of even greater decline. Quite a few of the people in the local community were sort of alarmed at the state of the castle and we've been fighting for a better future for the castle and the gardens and the land surrounding it. We failed to buy it when it came up for sale in the early 2000s but we bought the woodland instead and that's now 175 acres that are protected and being um, enhanced as a, uh, a wonderful, almost like a little nature reserve really, and uh, a great place for biodiversity, lots of species are coming back. The whole woodland has come back to life. It has dormice there, great horseshoe bats flying through it, there are great crested newts everywhere. So. It just proves that nature can come back when it's given a chance. We still would love the opportunity to buy the castle and see it improved in the way there are lots of examples now across Wales who've been very good about appreciating these wonderful historic landscapes that are layered up with stories, layered up with history, layered up with archaeology, incredibly important for the, what they can contribute to our well-being and the nature of uh, of Wales. If you think of Aberglasny is a wonderful example, how that was ruinous and was saved and is now one of the key tourist sites for Wales. Absolutely stunning how they've recreated an ancient garden like Ruperas around the house and restored parts of the house. Joseph Atkins of Aberglasny, which is as you know our model, our aspiration, our dream, He's going to explain all about the gardens at Aberglasny. Good morning, my name's Joseph Atkin. I'm the head gardener at Aberglasny Gardens, and I'm pleased to give you an introduction into Aberglasny, its history, its restoration, and how we've got to where we are today. 
So today, Abba Glasny is an 11 and a half acre garden with about 20 different garden styles. It has been restored over a 20 year period with very, very, very many different layers of work that have gone on. And it has been nominated as one of the top 10 formal gardens in the UK. It is also considered one of the best gardens in Wales and is nationally recognised. So after all of this hard work and all the wonderful contributions of various people and societies and so on, Aberglasny has been restored to its former glory, but the journey is not over yet. So the restoration process at Aberglasny, it's been a very long and carefully worked out process with a lot of phases and a lot of layers to it. Over the last 20 years, Aberglasny has made about nine purchases of land all of which have come together to put an 11 acre site together. The first phase of the restoration was to do a conservation management plan and do a survey of the entire site as a whole to see what you had that was significant and what was here of value from a heritage point of view. Archaeological surveys were carried out and the site and all of these information was brought together to put a master plan in place. This master plan was then used as a basis for the development of the site as a whole. One of the key features at Aberglasny is the U tunnel, which you see behind me. It's 350 years old and originally, 20 years ago, the upper branches of it were actually growing in through the first floor of the house that you see behind me. It's one of the oldest garden features in the whole world and it has taken 20 years of restoration, careful pruning, careful care to bring this, this wonderful feature back to, its, back to its former glory. This is the upper wall garden at Aberglasny and we consider this to be a piece of successful restoration. We're really pleased with the work and how it, how it all turned out here. Originally, as you can see from the images, this area was completely and utterly derelict and barely recognisable to what we have today. So it was one of the first areas of Aberglasny Gardens that was restored, along with the Cloister Gardens. We developed a garden which was both a Celtic cross and a herbaceous border. And that was really, really, really clever because it's a Welsh garden, so there was the Celtic angle, and it was also a, a cross, and all of the gardens at Aberglasny have this cruciform design, which keeps our connection to the church because of Bishop Rudd, which was really, really important. Once we'd completed the design, we installed it, and when you walk around it, it's quite lovely because it's, it's something of a Victorian, not garden close up, and then it's a design cross garden, cruciform garden from, from a distance. So it works really, really well. It was a huge amount of work to, to restore it. And it's like all good herbaceous gardens, it just keeps evolving and keeps developing over time. So after 25 years of hard work, Abba Glasny is a fully up and running private charitable trust. With the help of donations, and contributions from private, public and government sources, Aberglasny is a real, uh, wonderful heritage garden of excellence. Over these 20 years, we've worked to a very clear plan of how we want to develop and where we want to go. And we've created a private charitable trust that is really durable and is safe and safeguarded for the future. Through our experiences at Aberglasny, one of the things we have found is that sharing knowledge is so important and for people to work together and to, to collaborate. So there are some key pieces of Aberglasny's experiences that I think are very useful to other people. And one of those is that Aberglasny had a very clear purpose from the beginning. The original benefactors really wanted Aberglasny to be a heritage garden of excellence. And that theme and that philosophy has run through what we do right the way through today. And it continues to be our main purpose as we move forward. The other key piece of advice I would always like to offer is beware of one pitfall and that is that you can overdevelop the garden to the point where you're not sustainable. As you do each piece of the development, make sure there's a sustainability plan in place for it. So after many years of hard work, it's become a real privilege to be involved with Aberglasny. The whole site is developed and we've provided wonderful opportunities economically, socially and environmentally. But our work's not finished here. It's been lovely to be involved in this sustainable Philly landscape project because we met all sorts of people with all sorts of different interests to ours. 
you know, people like to watch things like they say now there's a white, white tailed eagle up on Redry Mountain, that's exciting. And we've all learned from each other. It's been a great project. And quite unusually, a bottom up initiative, which is always to be celebrated, bringing people together getting them to understand what's on their doorstep. And of course, there are models out there of really good projects, successful projects, such as um, at Aberglasney, where they've had a, a similar model to ours, a similar project. And, you know, we've visited there and Joseph has guided us around the site and explained the, <laughs> the amount of dedication and the amount of work, but wow, isn't it worth it? It's a fantastic, fantastic garden and fantastic house. Really, really excellent and shows what can be done when people pull together, when communities pull together and learn from one another and celebrate these places and, and cherish them and make sure they have a future and a worthwhile purpose. <laughs>